Hello and good evening. My name is Nick Bletsky. I'm proud to welcome you to the first industry webinar, educational webinar from ESRA, pre-peritoneal wound infiltration catheter in laparoscopic colorectal surgery. This webinar is provided to you by Pyramid. We have more than 1,100 registrations, and we are very happy to see that much interest in this educational offering. Please note that this is a free non-CME webinar. Uh, since we are going with a webinar setup, there's no microphone and no video available for the attendees. Only the presenters can be seen and, and heard. Uh, if you want to communicate with other attendees, please pick the right recipient group in the chat window. And uh, if you want to ask questions about uh, the presentation, please use the Q&A functionality of Zoom at the bottom of the screen. You, if you want to anonymize your questions, you can do that by checking the corresponding box in the Q&A uh, message window. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We assume we will have around 15 to 20 minutes for your questions. As you, will, as you see, the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available for uh, viewing approximately a, a week after this live webinar on the Pine GmbH YouTube channel. Our speakers tonight are Dr. Ansgar Harms and Dr. Jerome Fogelar from the Netherlands, who will be taking over now. Enjoy the presentation and thank you. Thank you, Nick, for this uh, kind introduction and, uh, of course, for the possibility to share uh, the enthusiasm of Ansgar and I uh, concerning this topic. Uh, we, will, um, we are both uh, working in uh, a Fituri Medical Center in Venlo, the southern part of the Netherlands, and this will, we have no disclosures, and this will be the agenda we will talk you through. Um, we thought it was a nice uh, to start with some historical uh, developments uh, on surgical uh, and on anesthesiological uh, parts. And then we uh, walk through um, uh, uh, the whole uh, talk. So uh, first something about history. The history of abdominal surgery demonstrates a magnificent evolution from the ancient years uh, till the, uh, to the present. But uh, as a surgeon, I think with a lot of anesthesiologists in the, the audience, uh, I have to behave a little bit uh, modest um, uh, because the major landmarks in the development of abdominal surgery were not typical surgical. So the, the drastic uh, progress during the past centuries was initiated by the development of anesthetic techniques. Uh, the other important landmark in history was the recognition of antisepsis and antimicrobial therapy as a key component of favorable operative outcomes. Nonetheless, surgery is invasive and subjecting the human body to significant stress with impact on a variety of uh, systems, cardiovascular, respiratory and immune. And of course, consequently, surgical stress affects organ homeostasis which may be well tolerated by fit subjects, but also gives a uh, possible and significant risk to frail patients. And that is the group we are especially interested in. Irrespective of physical status, surgery causes pain and, it uh, and pain itself causes stress. So after these landmarks, uh, it soon became clear that small incisions induced less operative stress. Well, anesthesia uh, and analgesia and antisepsis have provided a stable foundation for general surgery for many years. Investigators and surgeons have struggled to reduce the size of incision. It was more than 100 years ago that George Kelling performed the first laparoscopy uh, on a dog. And his uh, colleague, uh, Christian Jacobus from, I think it was Stockholm, he performed uh, a lot of research and also did the first laparoscopy in human. And again, there's a small role for the surgeon because George Kelly was an internist of all people, just like Jacobus, and was a gynecologist from Germany 
that performed the first uh, laparoscopic appendectomy. Uh, but finally, there came the surgeon. It was Eric Muir, and he performed the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So um, this is about the uh, development of laparoscopic surgery. So uh, things changed in years. This picture is about uh, 100 years ago when the scrub nurses looked like uh, aliens and uh, the, the bottle of gas was the only thing the, anesthesi the anesthesiologist could use. And nowadays, this is the normal situation in most of the operation theaters, and maybe even in some theaters, the robot has taken place. But still, we have incisions, and still, we need pain therapy. So that's, I would like to ask Ansgar to tell us more about it. Well, I'll give a short summary about the uh, pain therapy and what happened through the years. Um, in the 80s and 90s, the 2000s, and uh, now that we are talking about laparoscopic uh, surgery. Uh, can you do the next slide? In the 80s and 90s, it was uh, days before the operation, the patient uh, had to fast. Uh, the bowels were cleaned by purging. Uh, anesthesia was just general anesthesia. In the 80s, uh, you didn't use any epidurals because you just ha hadn't any uh, suitable material. In the 90s, uh, we first had to convince the surgeons that uh, epidural anesthesia and anesthesia uh, doesn't do anything to their anastomosis. Pain management was done with uh, uh, morphine. We often had post-operative nausea and vomiting, ileus, no enteral feeding until the first passage of stool. So patients had to stay uh, just on IV few uh, liquids uh, the first couple of days after the operations. And uh, yeah, hospital stay was uh, very long. Next, please. In the early 2000s, uh, we still had open laparotomy uh, always and there was uh, epidural unless you had a really strong contraindication. Uh, we started with prehabilitation. Um, eating was allowed as long as possible and as soon as possible was restarted after the operation. We gave less fluids than uh, earlier. Uh, we did prophylaxis to uh, avoid nausea and vomiting. Um, but there still were some problems uh, because uh, of the catheter uh, for the urinary and the epidural catheter. Uh, patients couldn't uh, mobilize as fast as uh, sometimes wished. But uh, there was a, a extremely a faster discharge after than uh, with earlier protocols. Next, please. This is a, a picture of uh, prehabilitation. Uh, you see the red line where uh, the patient is uh, just stable on his uh, yeah, pre-operation uh, status, is being brought down uh, to, yeah, uh, under his, uh, um, under this uh, level. <clears throat> And uh, after the operation has to, um, yeah, um, to uh, recuperate uh, very slowly. With uh, prehabilitation, we try to improve the status of the patient before the operation. That's the green line. Um, <clears throat> and uh, to, uh, with the operation, uh, we took the patient only very short under the uh, um, minimum level of functioning, and uh, after the operation, the recuperation uh, was very fast. Of, of, we tried to get it faster. Prehabilitation, what does it mean? It means uh, exercise before the operation, um, feeding as long and as good as possible, uh, meaning that uh, cancer patients uh, get uh, extra feeding uh, to make them just a little bit better if possible. A big 
uh, part of prehabilitation is education of the patient. We try to um, uh, make them stop smoking. And uh, in recent times, uh, we also correct anemia uh, just to make the start faster. Next picture, please. The next step was the laparoscopic surgery. That's what uh, you, Rune, uh, always uh, already mentioned. Uh, with laparoscopic surgery, you have uh, less pain. Uh, with less pain, uh, it's slowly becoming interesting if you really need an epidural uh, for the pain therapy. Uh, certainly because uh, the last uh, 10 years, um, there were some studies uh, pointing at uh, rather high numbers of complications uh, with uh, epidural anesthesia. Um, there were up to uh, one per, per thousand to one to per six thousand um, uh, serious com uh, complications with uh, epidural anesthesia. Um, and as well as uh, with the uh, earlier, what I earlier said, um, the mobilization is very difficult with uh, epidural catheter and with uh, uh, urinary uh, catheter. And uh, yeah, discharge is just faster uh, if the patient gets mobilized uh, fast. But there still remains a uh, problem. Uh, you have just um, a small incision uh, still necessary to get the tumor out. And uh, yeah, what has the anesthetist to offer in this uh, case? Uh, there are some regional techniques. Uh, the transverse abdominal plane block, um, the transmuscular quadratus lumborum block, and the erector spinae block can be used for this, just to uh, anesthetize the uh, abdominal uh, wall. Next one, please. This is a, a picture of the uh, ultrasound guided uh, transverse abdominus plane block. Next picture, please. Uh, there you have the quadratus lumborum block. Uh, as you see on the picture, um, it looks a little bit uh, complicated. Uh, in real life, it's not easier than uh, on this uh, anatom anatomical picture. Next picture, please. Uh, there's the erector spinae block. It's easier to perform. Uh, you see the indications. Uh, it could be used for abdominal surgery, torical surgery, breast surgery, spine surgery, chronic pain, rib fractures. I've uh, used it for some of these uh, um, indications and it uh, works rather good. Um, but we don't use it for the abdominal uh, surgery. Next picture, please. Why we don't use it? Um, uh, if the incision uh, crosses midline, you uh, would need a double-sided block. Um, the block is uh, just uh, yeah, performed as uh, single shots, then it works a couple of hours and that's it. then it works out. Uh, you could use a catheter, but for this block, that's uh, al uh, always high volume blocks. So you would need uh, rather high concentrations and rather high uh, amounts of uh, local anesthetic. Um, I don't know how it's with you, uh, your patients, but our patients uh, don't have the optimal BMI for uh, ultrasound uh, of 20 to, uh, 20 to 25, as in workshops or in books. Um, another problem is that after the operation, it's actually too late. Uh, before the operation, uh, well, a uh, wake patient, uh, to prick blocks on awake patients, uh, if you uh, will make them asleep a couple of minutes later, isn't uh, really friendly. Uh, so you would have to do it after the patient sleeps and then the surgeon would have to wait. Um, our surgeons don't like to wait. Uh, the timing, anesthetists uh, don't like to start much before the surgeons do. So uh, getting up an hour earlier to do uh, some kinds of blocks, uh, my colleagues don't like that. Um, yeah, uh, thus what do we do with the laparoscopic surgery? We just give uh, standard pain therapy with opioids and some paracetamol. Um, you could use NSAIDs, uh, but um, 
that's no option because our surgeons uh, yeah, have some problems with uh, more um, of presumably more anastomotic uh, leakages when using NSA days. Um, there is uh, some discussion over this and uh, it it's, will be followed. There are studies going on and uh, we'll see if that can change the next couple of times. What patients are we talking about? We're talking about older age. We're talking about multiple comorbidities. We're talking about frail uh, patients. And all these uh, patients are prone to opioid side effects. So that's a little bit difficult. Uh, Jeroen will tell something about the patients of the- Yes. Thank you, Ansgar. Uh, colorectal cancer is one of the commonest uh, cancers in the Western world. And this uh, graphic shows us that uh, the peak incidence is about uh, the, 70, uh, the seventh decade. And um, this picture is the colon cancer incidence in the last uh, 25 uh, years in the Netherlands. And also here, the two, uh, the, the purple and the light blue line are the age groups above 60 years old. And this one is the rectal cancer incidence. The graphic is about the same. And uh, you see an interesting uh, peak incidence about uh, 2040. And uh, this was the year when the population-based screening program for colorectal cancer started in the Netherlands. So that's the reason for the, for the peak. Um, this is a typical picture of the older population with colorectal cancer suffering from substantial comorbidity, especially cardiovascular, diabetes, COPD, and hypertension. And therefore, uh, it's important to try to find out which patients are prone to side effects of uh, treatment. So therefore, in our hospital, we screen our patients for, for frailty, according to the international guidelines. And we have chosen for a two-step approach First step involves a geriatric screening test to identify patients who might be at risk uh, of being frail. And we use the G8 score and the four meter gait speed test. And uh, when, one of the, uh, when one of the tests will be underscored, the patient is sent to a geriatrician for a complete uh, comprehensive geriatric uh, assessment. So the, the pre-screening does really work uh, well. Uh, otherwise, you have sent all the patients uh, to the geriatrician and it would take a lot of work. So frailty is an important item, also in colorectal cancer, uh, due to the rapidly aging uh, population. Uh, Preoperative pre frailty is not only uh, independently associated with mortality, it might also be influenced the recurrence-free survival. So uh, all the efforts are tended to minimize the perioperative uh, risks. Ansgar. Okay. Uh, yeah, without the epidural, uh, the common alternative is the use of opioids. Everybody has heard about the opioid crisis in uh, the US. Uh, in the Lancet, uh, there was an article uh, 2017 that uh, 2 million Americans abuse prescription opioids. Uh, the sale of uh, those quadrupled uh, since 1999. Uh, according to the Center of Disease Control, 130 dead uh, Americans, uh, Americans are dying per day. Uh, and that's only the data of uh, 2017. After that, it's still, there still was a little race in this. Next one, please. Uh, you see on this uh, uh, a picture how the uh, development was. Looking at the curves, you see uh, the almost exponential rise in the death toll starting around 2013, 2014. Um, next one, please. Um, what, what about Europe? Uh, America is not uh, where most of us uh, people uh, work, but in Europe, uh, I've got some data from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, the number of opioid users doubled between 2008 and 2017. That's uh, uh, reason therefore is uh, that uh, in that time, uh, opioids were more and more used, not only for cancer pain, 
but also for just uh, chronic pain uh, problems. The oxycodone use uh, quadrupled, obviously good marketing, not only in the US, uh, but uh, in Europe as well. The uh, number of hospital uh, admissions uh, because of uh, opioid problems uh, tripled and uh, the addiction care doubled uh, in that time. The mortality uh, stayed rather uh, at the same level between 2008 and 2014 and tripled between 2014 and 2017. It's still not uh, the same amount as in uh, the US, but uh, it's, um, yeah, it, it could become a problem. Uh, advantages of less opioids is uh, for every anesthetist uh, uh, yeah, daily business. Uh, you have less nausea, less uh, vomiting. Uh, patients are less sedated. Uh, you see uh, afterwards that there's less gastrointestinal uh, ileus. Immunosuppression is becoming a hot item and uh, morphines of op or opioids are uh, one of the possible reasons therefore. And yeah, respira respiratory uh, depression is also uh, uh, less with that. Next one, please. Now there is an uh, option of opioid-free uh, surgery, uh, opioid-free anesthesia. Um, <clears throat> in a big um, review that I read uh, with some 50,000 operation, five to six percent of the patients were operated opioid free. Um, the length of stay was shorter in the non-opioid group, uh, but uh, longer than what we usually uh, need for our patients uh, that we uh, operate in family with uh, opioids. Um, laparoscopic surgery had less um, morphine milligram equival equivalents than uh, open surgery. That's uh, yeah, normal. It's it's just less pain uh, painful, so you don't need as much morphine. And yeah, I'm not really convinced uh, of that uh, alternative. Um, we've had some uh, young colleagues uh, who just came from university uh, to. Uh, strengthen our team and fellow and uh, yeah, they didn't actually promote that uh, opioid free anesthesia so um, maybe it's an option for the two, uh, for the future but i still am not convinced of that uh, so what are we actually looking for for the uh, anesthesia we're looking first of all it has to be safe safe, 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 that's the most important. We're looking for less or no opioids. Uh, it has to be easy and fast to do. It uh, should be done by any anesthetist and any surgeon, so it uh, should actually be foolproof. Um, you would want as little preparation as, uh, as uh, possible um, to uh, do this. And you would need a little logistical efforts. Uh, if you have to order some special uh, instruments weeks before the operation, that's certainly nothing you can uh, use every day. And that is where um, Jeroen comes in. Yes, and that's also where the continuous wound infiltration uh, is probably coming on stage. So uh, it potentially has the perfect combination of all the previous mentioned uh, analgetic uh, items and uh, less side effects probably. But what do we know uh, already from this technique? Because uh, it isn't uh, 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 invented uh, this year. There's already a meta-analysis from Sweden in uh, 2011, uh, which included uh, 32 studies. And it showed that the most prominent superior effect of this technique was in obstetric patients, but well, those are younger and those are women, of course. In all other groups, the continuous wound infiltration was non-inferior to any traditional uh, technique. Uh, in general, there was a lower morphine use, uh, especially in the first uh, 24 hours, and also a little shorter hospital stay than the traditional, the traditional pain uh, therapy. And uh, it, it showed a very low incidence of complications. But it has to be said, this study is very heterogeneous. 
Um, and uh, not only the type of surgery were very different, also the types of incision. And uh, there were a, a, a large amount of open procedures. Nowadays, uh, more than uh, 75, 80% of all the colorectal procedures will be performed in a laparoscopic uh, mode. Um, and there was also a difference in technique of positioning the wound catheter. Uh, only four of the this uh, 32 studies uh, in this meta-analysis concerned colorectal procedures, both uh, open and uh, laparoscopic. And this, uh, this review, a little bit later, 2030, also very interesting because it compared epidural uh, with continuous local anesthetic and static wound infiltration techniques. And the primary aim of this study was to compare these two methods with regard to post-operative uh, post pain, of course. Uh, and they used a numeric, numeric uh, rating skill. Um, and the secondary aims were to compare the morphine requirements, opiate requirements, nausea, vomiting, urinary retention, and the local catheter-related problems and treatment failure. Uh, this review included nine studi studies, and again, uh, significant heterogeneity, unfortunately, between all the included studies, and there were various types of abdominal surgery. Also, from a surgical view, uh, there were several incision types, subcostal or lower abdominal, midline or transverse, and uh, maybe very important, different positions of the catheter. Um, only three of the nine studies were at an EROS-like or any enhanced recovery program. So this is not really mirroring the situation of nowadays, but gives us more information that uh, it demonstrates that local anesthetic uh, is non-inferior non to what we usually used for laparoscopic colorectal surgery, uh, namely epidural. But uh, the epidural an uh, analgesia was an uh, associated with non-significant trends towards reduced opiate use, lower pain on movement when it was administered continuously, uh, but it was associated as Ansgar told us already, and we know from the daily, the, uh, daily practice with a higher incidence of urinary retention. And also in this analysis, low rates of complications of the catheters. So it, it might be interesting that the clue is in the position of the catheter. Um, because the periotal uh, peritoneum uh, might play a large role uh, in post-operative pain. And that's this study. It's from uh, the group of uh, Mark Besselink and Mungrobe in Amsterdam, 2019. And the aim of this study was to assess the outcomes between the preperitoneal and the subcutaneous placed wound catheters. Um, because the subcutaneous catheters only uh, anesthetize the, the upper layer of the abdominal wall, but, but as said before, um, uh, there's uh, uh, growing evidence that the peritoneal, uh, the, the peritoneum plays a large role in, uh, in, in, in the post-operative pain. So they uh, hypothesized that pre-peritoneal catheters are associated with comparable, uh, comparable outcome uh, to epidural analgesia, and they are superior to subcutaneous catheters. Uh, 26 studies are compared. As you can see, what they compared, the continuous wound infiltration with the uh, uh, two positions, also versus the active control and versus saline. The endpoints were the pain scores at uh, 12 and 48 hours postoperatively, the opiate consumption, uh, the pain treatment related complications, technical failure, and all the other things mentioned here on the sheet. So um, the conclusion of this review was that it was the first systematic review and meta-analysis 
that uh, showed continuous wound infiltration as effective for pain management in abdominal surgery and the pre peritoneal placement was more effective uh, than the subcutaneous placement. So um, that may be the clue for our practice. And um, on the left uh, on the sheet is from my Sobota Atlas. And um, the reason I put the picture here is that we, for most uh, laparoscopic colorectal uh, surgery, uh, we use the small incision, the, the so-called uh, funnel steel incision. And that's in the area where the linear arcuata, uh, it's below the linear arcuata. So there's no um, posterior fascia. That means that uh, there's a perfect place and uh, where you can uh, put a catheter because the peritoneum in that area is very floppy and not fixated to the fascia. That's the reason why it's easier to perform it in laparoscopic surgery uh, compared to the picture on the other side, with open surgery. It's not always easy to close the peritoneum and there are also some drawbacks. For example, previous surgery uh, that you even cannot uh, close. Uh, there's a lack of peritoneum or enlarged tumors that you have to remove peritoneum or a loop colostomy uh, in case of rectal cancer. Uh, this is the stepwise the technique of the continuous wound catheter. Um, in our hospital, the pharmacist uh, prefers the uh, elastomer pump after we uh, prescribe it uh, at our OPD, our patient department. Uh, it can also be uh, prepared by the assistant of the anesthesiologist during the operation, but we choose uh, to have it prepared by the pharmacist. Uh, important to mention uh, that before we start the operation, we always infiltrate all the trocar ports with a local anesthetic. Uh, and you can perfectly see it with your camera that you uh, put a depot in the pre peritoneal area. Uh, well, after we uh, perform the resection, uh, we take out the, the specimen through the van der Steel incision, then we close the peritoneum, and then we uh, place the catheter I will show you in a movie on the next slide. And then we give a bolus of 20 milliliter ropivaca in with this concentration. And then for three days, the elastomer pump is uh, filled uh, for three days uh, uh, with uh, five milliliter per hour. Uh, before we start the movie, I would like to mention some small uh, pitfalls that can happen on the uh, on the nursery ward, there can be a leakage, it can be simply helped with a, a gauze or a, we call it a tegaderm. Uh, the catheter can be luxated, unfortunately. Well, then you cannot replace it because it's placed during the operation. And uh, it can give insufficient uh, pain killing. So then uh, you have to check first if the infuse is open. We had two patients. Uh, one month ago, that uh, we didn't open that uh, white, uh, the, uh, the white thing on the uh, on the tube. So uh, after we opened it, it was uh, much more comfortable. I will run through this video. Well, at this time, the the specimen is uh, is taken out. The pair's name is closed, and then with a puncture and a needle after removing the needle. We put in the catheter, we chose, and here you see the holes in the catheter with all the drops. So you check if it's open and this is the seven centimeter we chose for this incision where the ropivacaine is coming out. Then you remove this and the catheter is placed on the peritoneum under the fascia. You see a small, a small loop, but in here we straighten the loop so there will not be a knot uh, after removing. 
and then we use this uh, fixation material. And after closing the fascia, the bolus will be given. And totally, this will this will take, well, I think three to five minutes. And this is the bolus of Europivacaina. And with a little key, you can put it on the concentration you like to give. And Maybe Ansgar can tell something about the safety of the concentration uh, we use. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, there was a study with uh, tr uh, transverse abdominal plane blocks where they put uh, two si sided catheters uh, in the wound, uh, did rather high doses uh, for the loading dose with uh, 400 milligrams with patients both uh, above 70 kilos. And after that, an infusion of uh, 28 milligrams per hour for the first uh, 24 hours, uh, which would be uh, around about 672 milligrams per uh, 24 hours, uh, and up to uh, 2,260 milligrams in 72 hours. With our regimen, uh, we only use 40 milligram bolus, and after that, uh, 700 milligram. Uh, within the next uh, three days. So uh, we stay much below the um, tested regimen of uh, the uh, people around Hessian. And uh, yeah, that's what I consider a safe uh, method. Yeah. And, and there might, I think there might be space to, uh, to, to maybe personalize or to, uh, to enhance the the 40 milligram, uh, but that will be for future uh, study. Um, after a small and successful pilot, we implemented this technique in, uh, in our hospital and we shared the results uh, with some colleagues and especially uh, my colleague, Dr. Blumen, surgeon in uh, uh, Katharina Hospital in Eindhoven was also very enthusiastic and we both um, uh, are now conducting a prospective uh, analysis of patients of our hospital and I will show you the preliminary results of our first 138 patients. Um, these are the results of the both, uh, the both hospitals and uh, there was a little spoiling of uh, non-colorectal cancer operations, a small bowel resection, a cholecystectomy, um, and maybe also some ileocecal sections for a crone maybe, but the, the general were all laparoscopic colore uh, colorectal cancer operation uh, performed in our two hospitals. Uh, the medium length of stay before we implemented uh, was uh, between five and six days. To be honest, near more near six than near five days, uh, the median hospital stay. And after in, uh, implementation in this series, uh, the me median length of hospital stay uh, is four days in our hospital, and uh, it was e it's even three days in the Katharina Hospital. Uh, what has to be mentioned is that the Katharina Hospital is, uh, has now implemented the latest ERAS uh, protocol, and uh, we are now starting up for the refresher course, so we hope to also win some days. But this is a win of at least two days uh, compared to um, uh, two years ago. Uh, the opioid use on the uh, first day of the, the day of the operation was a little bit different, but uh, still, well, quite a lot of patients need some morphine. So maybe there will be uh, some winning of uh, higher, uh, higher bolus, or uh, we will discuss that maybe later. But the, um 65 percent of the patients so two-thirds of the patients um don't use any morphine or opioid like medication on the day after the operation and the second day is even lower um only 25 percent is using opiates so um well we were very happy with this these results and also the maximum pain scores uh with a scale from uh, zero to ten 
uh, is low and uh, also com comparable, I think, with the epidural uh, scores from the literature. So what, what will we discuss uh, in, in the future in our hospital? We would like to implement it in the acute and the, the laparotomy setting. You need a slightly different technique uh, because of the uh, closing of the peritoneum and the larger incision. Uh, uh, it's a kind of um, a tunneling, maybe with two catheters, but we will find out. We didn't do it yet. Um, according to literature, the highest level of evidence uh, is also there for the caesarean section. So I'll try to uh, make our gynecologist also enthusiastic for this technique. And from our orthopedic surgeons, I know that there is a randomized controlled trial together with the Maastricht University in spondylodes patients, also uh, with the uh, continuous wound infiltration. And uh, in general, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the fine tuning of the dose, maybe we can work to a uh, patient specific dose uh, and uh, we have to impl implement it in HEROS protocols together uh, with the whole team uh, from a scientific uh, uh, viewpoint uh, it would be in, uh, very interesting to measure the effect on inflammation or immune system or even maybe uh, cancer cell development etc especially in this uh, population so coming to our conclusions uh, the continuous wound infiltration catheter in laparoscopic colorectal surgery is in our opinion, feasible, very safe, and easy to perform. It reduces uh, uh, morphine use. Uh, it minimizes pain scores and helps to shorten the length of stay. And it perfectly fits in any eras like protocol. And it's particularly interesting in the older uh, population. So that was what we would like to share with you with special thanks to the research students of our study and my colleague, Dr. Blumen from the Katharina Hospital and our pharmacist in Venlo. And of course, Ellie Roos for all the practical support and my son, Jelle Vogelaar for editing the one of a movie. Maybe there are some questions. Um, I think there's a question for Ansgar. Yeah. Uh, do you, uh, it's from, um, do you ever use spinal uh, uh, opioids or uh, lidocaine or IV ketamine and what's your opinion about that? We don't have any experience with uh, spinal opioids. Uh, I read about it but uh, we don't use them uh, ourselves in uh, Venlo. Uh, we, uh, some of my colleagues use uh, IV lidocaine uh, and uh, sometimes we use uh, IV ketamine uh, depending on uh, the kind of patient uh, we get uh, and uh, yeah we're still experimenting with it we don't have an uh, actual protocol uh, for this um, okay. the next question is uh, what about continuous spinal anesthesia uh, I think there you would uh, um, have the same problem with an epidural uh, catheter uh, also with a spinal uh, continuous spinal uh, anesthesia, you would uh, have problems uh, mobilizing the patient uh, and uh, yeah, uh, actually you would use that for longer pain uh, therapy. And our do, uh, main, uh, main aim is to get the patient mobi mobilized as soon as possible and uh, get them moving and out of the hospital as soon as it's uh, possible. Okay. Uh, another question was about the review. Um, uh, what kind of uh, gynecological procedures? Those were mainly the caesarean sections. And that was the group where the, the effect of the continuous wound infiltration was the, was the best. So they had the, the longest uh, effect, uh, longer than 24 hours of the, uh, of the analgesia. And one question, next question is, there was, uh, let me see, um, there was a lower wound infection, lower wound breakdown in the, um, in the group 
of the wound catheter in the review. Uh, Ansgar, can you uh, explain why that could be? Um, in... no. like, can it be the effect of the local anesthesia? Uh, is, it, is it antibacterial? Uh, local anesthetics are uh, antibacterial. Um, in uh, any case, uh, yeah, bacteria don't grow uh, in uh, local anesthetics, so that could uh, explain uh, part of it. That's also a reason why uh, you don't see uh, infections or a lot of infections uh, when local anesthetics uh, are used. So that could explain that. Um, there was a question about uh, different uh, different uh, local anesthetics, ropivacaine, bupivacaine. Uh, I think you could use uh, anything in a, a rather low concentration. Uh, we use uh, ropivacaine, two milligram per uh, milliliter. That would be equivalent to bupivacaine, uh, not uh, zero point one two five. Um, milligram uh, percent, sorry, and uh, that would uh, also uh, do the trick. Uh, only we chose uh, ropivacaine because it's uh, considered a little bit uh, safer uh, on uh, cardiorespiratory problems. Okay. Um, Another question uh, is, uh, in our units, most surgeons do not close the peritoneum. Obviously, this technique won't be efficient without peritoneum stitches, question mark. Uh, uh, it is necessary to close the peritoneum. Uh, as mentioned, it's most easy in the Pfannenstiel region, but with, for example, a midline uh, incision, uh, it isn't always that easy. Um, and before, we, we, we don't use it yet in that situation. So uh, also we don't close it uh, specifically. I know in the Catherine Hospital where they perform more uh, redo surgery or locally advanced surgery after previous surgery, uh, they, uh, they intend to close, uh, to the best of my knowledge, all uh, peritoneum incisions. But uh, you're true. Uh, it's true that you need to close the peritoneum to have the maximum effect uh, of the ropivacaine. Uh, here's a question uh, about uh, the um, systemic effects of the uh, continuous wound uh, infiltration. Well, uh, if I look at the patients uh, uh, in the recovery wards, uh, I see that they don't have any pain uh, with the incision uh, where the uh, catheter lies. And uh, for the rest, uh, they do have uh, rather normal uh, pain from the uh, laparoscopic uh, wounds. They do need some morphine, but it's uh, just uh, in total less than uh, they used to uh, need before we uh, used this technique. So uh, I would say it's more the local effect than uh, the uh, systemic effect. Okay. Then uh, a technical question of the precise position of the uh, and the direction of the catheter uh, in the Pfannenstiel incision, um, because the incision in the skin and the fascia is in a transverse direction, and then you open the, uh, the muscles uh, in a median uh, way. Um, well, the, the catheter is from laterally, as you could see in the movie, um, uh, placed under the transverse, uh, under the muscle. So uh, through the fascia, uh, uh, through the, the muscle and on the peritoneum. And there was a question, are there any issues with the infection? In our series, there were no complications of infection in the, um, uh, the wound catheter. We had two patients, uh, I think one in each hospital, I think uh, that um, the catheter was, uh, uh, was, was fallen out uh because of traction or something so uh, that was uh, that that were those were two failures uh, uh, a question about uh, the intraoperative use of lidocaine uh, infusion and uh the regarding the uh, la to local anesthetic to toxicity uh, afterwards uh, if we still use a catheter um we 
did that uh, with some patients. We didn't see any problems. Uh, you would just have to uh, look at the patient and uh, uh, act from case to case. Um, I don't have any data of uh, the uh, um, yeah, toxicity of uh, the combination of lidocaine and afterwards uh, ropivacaine. Okay. Uh, do you need to pass the, the NOAC, uh, the blood thin medication, before inserting the catheter? Well, usually, unless there's a very firm uh, indication uh, for the NOAC, the, uh, we, we stop the NOAC two days before surgery. So um, the effect, that's, that's also uh, the effect on the inserting catheter. Um, a question about rectus sheath catheters. Uh, I don't have any experience with the rectus sheath catheter. Um, maybe, do you have Ansgar? Uh, no, I don't. Comp no, I'm sorry, no. Um, a question about what opiate uh, we use. Uh, we use uh, normally uh, morphine, but uh, 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 pyrethromide would do the same. Uh, and uh, I think it doesn't make any difference uh, uh, which opiate you use. During the operation, we also, uh, always uh, use remifentanil uh, to get the patient uh, fit faster after the operation. Mm -hmm. And a question about uh, a, a remark and a question. Pain is a very subjective outcome measure. Are there any randomized data? Well, um, the randomized data uh, available uh, I try to uh, share in the meta-analysis in this uh, presentation. And, and of course it is very subjective. And, um, uh, and the, the, the studies I showed there, there, there can be a statistic um, uh, uh, significance of pain scores between, for example, epidural and continuous wound uh, infiltration, but the statistical significance of a pain score of four compared to two. Uh, the question is, is that, clear, is that clinically uh, also significant? So uh, that, that's a uh, good point. Uh, second remark from my side that, that we hope maybe it's possible to, uh, to personalize is it uh, before you start operation, uh, what kind of patient, what kind of procedure needs more a higher concentration or more than five milliliter per hour, for example. Uh, I see a, I see a question here about uh, uh, pausing of NOAX before inserting the catheter. For the catheter itself, uh, that's no problem, but uh, I think no surgeon would operate an abdominal uh, surgery uh, with uh, NOAX uh, actively. No. So, uh, ah. That's no problem and that's the graph. Okay. Oh, um, what? Let me see. Um, um, spinal anesthesia with hyperbaric anesthetic produces no motor block. Would it not be an option? That's a question for you, Ansgar, I think. Um, we don't use any spinal anesthesia for abdominal surgery um, uh, because, uh, yeah, it's um, you. You have uh, a lot of uh, problems with uh, hemodynamics, and uh, that's why we don't use it. Uh, morphine could be an option, but uh, we don't use uh, any spinal anesthesia in this. Uh, are there any contraindications? Well. Uh, the, the, uh, actually, the only contraindication uh, is when patient cannot uh, are, uh, do have an allergy uh, against uh, ropivacaine. Uh, so, to the best of my knowledge, that's the only contraindication. Yes. I see a question uh, about the erector spinae block. Uh, of its, if it's a good popular technique uh, of analgesia in this uh, in abdominal surgery, well, the uh, erector spinae block uh, works uh, for the abdominal wall, so uh, it would be uh, 
rather suitable uh, technique, um, but also here you would need uh, catheters and you would need uh, high volume. And uh, it's more difficult uh, to apply than uh, just uh, let the surgeon put in a catheter and uh, uh, connect that uh, elastomer pump. Another question, does the level of experience of a surgeon and anesthetist affect the results of the studies? And should this normally be examined in a study? Well, the, the movie I showed, uh, the catheter was placed by one of our residents. And uh, uh, just like uh, Ansgar showed in one of his slides, uh, it, it's quite foolproof. So even a surgeon can, um, can uh, place it in a quite easy way. So I think there is no experience, it's not, there's no experience issue. Another question about the local anesthetics uh, we are using. Uh, we don't use any marcaine, but that's uh, just a choice of our hospital uh, to use the presumably safest uh, uh, local anesthetic. And uh, that's the uh, Robia vacaine in, in our case. Uh, any experience with children? We don't have, and um, I don't know if there is, but um, I, I don't know. I, and I, is there any pain difference between colon and rectal surgery? And so do we need to purpose epidural analgesia for laparoscopic or robotic rectal surgery? Um, uh, rectal surgery, in case of an uh, rectal amputation, then the most painful wound is in the perineal area. Um, uh, I think it's easy to place a catheter in that area, but it, it, it has only a local function and there's no peritoneal uh, space to place it there. So, um, uh, also, the patients in our hospitals, uh, uh, there were also patients with rectal surgery, and they also had good, uh, uh, they also had good effect uh, of the uh, wound catheter. But it, but, but indeed, um, rectal surgery um, may be more extensive than uh, colon surgery. A question if uh, it's effective to add adjuvants like uh, dexmedetomidine or dexamethasone. Um, we don't uh, use that uh, in our uh, uh, experience until now. And uh, I think it's looking at that as just a local um, working of the local anesthetic. I don't expect much uh, uh, profit uh, from using any adjuvants. How does the patient mobilize with the uh, elastomere pump? Uh, well, they, they carry a very small uh, uh, bag, sort of a, a cartoon like, um, a cotton like bag um, that can be easily uh, carried. So uh, th that's not a restriction to sit on the bike uh, the next day or to walk with the physiotherapist or uh, etc. So the, the elastomere pump uh, is not that heavy or something. No. Did you try different rates of ropivacaina? In some studies, lower rates were not effective. Well, a lot of studies, uh, previous studies were very heterogeneous also uh, in um, the concentration, but also in the kind of incision and the kind of uh, uh, position of the catheter. So that's why it's very hard to compare. Uh, we didn't try we, in, in a few patients we uh, that had that were painful, but I think that those were less than uh, three or four. We uh, changed the concentration from five to eight uh, milligram with some effect and also some uh, uh, without effect. Uh, but well, that, that's for future research, I think to optimize and to personalize the concentration. How long do you leave the catheter in place? Uh, well, with uh, the five milliliter per, uh, per hour, the elastomere pump uh, is empty in uh, three days. 
So we take it out in three days or when the patient leaves the hospital earlier than three days. And another technical question, is it possible to use two catheters in a large incision? Yes, that is uh, possible. Um, and then uh, you can use a kind of a, a tunneling technique uh, to place it in the right, uh, in the right plane, subfacial preperitoneal. Um, Another question uh, about the uh, anticoagulation, uh, rivaroxaban. Um, well, if that's used uh, uh, for the removal of the catheter, that doesn't make any difference. Uh, it's uh, just uh, taking out a, a catheter that uh, uh, wouldn't do much harm, but uh, we wouldn't start any uh, anticoagulation uh, until the catheter is uh, taken out. Uh, can you use the usual epidural catheter set in this infusion? Ansgar, do you know? Uh, sorry, I, I was... Uh, can you use the usual epidural catheter set in this infusion? Uh, you could, but uh, the special catheter has uh, many holes, so the uh, local anesthetic uh, is uh, spread uh, in a special, uh, in, in the whole um, uh, area of the wound. Uh, you would use uh, different length of catheters as well if the uh, incision is longer and uh, the uh, epidural catheter only has uh, uh, one or two or, or maximum five openings uh, uh, in the end. So uh, that wouldn't be feasible for this uh, uh, technique. Okay. Um, so any more questions? I think. Uh, one more question. Uh, do you see a lot of leakage with the longer catheters? Uh, actually, uh, if the catheter is placed at the right space, uh, you see some leakage uh, along the catheter, but uh, it's, it's tunneled and uh, uh, there is some space where there's no, uh, no openings of the catheter. So there you uh, don't see uh, much leakage. Okay. Perfect. Thank you all for your attendance and all the questions. A uh, big thank you to our speakers for the presentation and all the answers they provided. We, ho we hope you enjoyed the session. I invite you to the upcoming industry education webinars, which will be announced through the Ezra website and the Ezra newsletters. We wish you a good evening and thank you for all the work that you've been doing with COVID-19 and stay safe. Thank you.